Hello and welcome to another installment of Grasping Scripture. I'm glad you could join us today as we delve into the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. It is great you can be part of this study, and I hope that God uses it to bless your life and to help you to grasp hold of the truths of Scripture and its significance in our lives. It is God's Word given to us. So let's enjoy this time together as we dig into His Word. Let's turn to Him in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before You in this time, Lord, we ask that You would give us ears to hear your voice, a heart sensitive to the promptings of your spirit. Father, and eyes to see your hands at work. Lord, as we study this text today, help us to not study it just as a literary work or as a work of history, but as your living word speaking to our lives, calling us to obedience to you. Father, draw us ever closer to you and keep us ever eager to hear your voice. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, as we pick up in the fourth chapter of Romans, uh, just a little bit of background, some things we need to just touch on the the situation the that we find ourselves in here uh, within the book of Romans is kind of unique. So Paul is addressing some peculiar situations. There's a power struggle in the church at Rome between the Jewish background Christians and the Gentile background Christians. And you could refer back to earlier podcast on Romans to get the full history of that. But what's happening here isn't just a Jewish Gentile background issue. There are those that are placing their Jewish heritage, their their Jewish identity above the gospel is really what's going on. They're saying, I'm right with God because I am Jewish, because I have been circumcised, because I have followed the laws and the rituals. And that's what you all need to do. And Paul is making it abundantly clear that that is not the case. That is a a profound misunderstanding, in, in essence, a discounting of God's grace, of the free gift of salvation and right standing with God. And so Paul addresses those issues here in the fourth chapter, and he does it pretty plainly. He goes back and he he frames his discussion. It's, it's framed in the way that Jewish rabbis would hold a discussion and make an argument, presenting a, a case from the books of the law, Genesis is what Paul's quoting from, and from the writings or prophets. And most of the other quotes we find in this chapter are from the book of Psalms. So we see that balance going on as Paul is just following a form of argument he's well acquainted with as a rabbi himself, and he is presenting it to a predominantly Jewish background audience that needs to hear and understand it. And so he addresses the issue of Abraham and Abraham standing with God and when certain things took place, like when was Abraham declared righteous with God in scripture? by God? When did the covenant take place? When did circumcision get instituted as the identifier for the Israelite people, for the descendants of Abraham? And the sequence of those events all becomes very important in this discussion. Because if the claim is that we are right with God because we have been circumcised, because we follow the law, because we're Abraham's descendants, then you've got to go back and you got to look at Abraham and say, okay, then what does Abraham actually represent? And when did these things actually take place? And that's what we're going to unpack in the fourth chapter of Romans today. So I thank you for joining us again, and we're going to dig into these passages of scripture. In verse one, it says, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. So Paul there is is identifying with the Jews. He's like, I'm one of you. And Abraham, we all agree, Abraham 
humanly speaking, is the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? So he said, let's go back to the beginning. Let's look at the founder of our Jewish nation, where we we hang our Jewish heritage on, that individual. And humanly speaking, it's Abraham. Ultimately speaking, it's God, yes. But humanly speaking, it's Abraham. So what, what did he discover about being made right with God? As he goes on, he says, if his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now we find that back in Genesis 15, verse 6. So we're going way back to get to that. At that point, Scripture makes it clear. God says that Abraham is counted as righteous for one reason, because of his faith. Now, just that statement there, that quote from from Genesis forms the backbone of what Paul is presenting throughout this chapter and in large part throughout the book of Romans. The foundation of our right standing with God, of our righteousness before God, is not built around rules, laws, uh, stipulations that have to be followed. It's built around one thing, faith in God. That's it placing our faith in God, specifically in Christ. So he goes on. He says, when people work, their wages are not a gift, but something that they have earned. Now that makes sense, right? If you work a job and your boss gives you a paycheck, is that paycheck a gift? No, it's payment for services rendered. It is a paycheck not a gift. For it to be a gift, it would have to be something you have not earned. The reality of our human condition is none of us have earned the righteousness of God. None of us have earned right standing before God. In fact, none of us can earn it because we all owe God everything. We would not exist apart from him. So, We have not earned anything from God. So when he gives us the gift of salvation, of right standing with him, it is a gift. It is impossible for us to earn it. There's no way we could do the necessary level of work, so to speak, to earn that gift. So again, when people work, their wages are not a gift but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who declared, who are declared righteous without working for it. Now here's, we've had the reference from the law, now the reference from writings. And and this is pulled out of Psalm, I think it's the Psalm 32. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. So Paul's saying, look, You can have this idea that you can earn right standing. You can do the work and be made right with God, and you're just wrong. Because we see in Scripture that righteousness comes by faith, not by work. It's not something we do to earn. It's something we receive as a gift because there's no way we could earn it. And then we see in Scripture this declaration from David about what a joy it is to be made right with God, to be forgiven for our sins, to be put out of his sight, for our record with the Lord to be cleared 
of sin. So there you go. He's pretty much laid it all out in the first eight verses. In nine, he goes on to say, now, is this blessing only for the Jews or is it also for uncircumcised Gentiles? Well, we've been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. Now, that's what Paul says. Why have we been saying that about Abraham? Well, because God said it back in the 15th chapter of Genesis, and he's already presented that. So he's saying, you know, here, here's our understanding. We're posed with this question. Is this blessing only for the Jews, or does it apply to the uncircumcised Gentiles as well? Now, the Jews are claiming their standing based on Abraham, so he takes us back to Abraham again. He says, well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. But verse 10, but how did this happen? How was he declared righteous by his faith? You know, some of the Jews may argue that, well, it's because he obeyed the laws, because he, he was circumcised, because he, Paul goes on, but how did this happen? Was he counted as righteous only after he was circumcised, or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Uh, clearly, because if you go back and read the Genesis account, he's declared righteous in chapter 15. Circumcision isn't instituted as a symbol of the covenant until chapter 17. So, you know, chronologically in the text, it's just, it's later that that's instituted. So that can't be the thing that made him righteous. And if it's not the thing that made him righteous, it can't be the thing that makes us righteous either. Of course, circumcision being a practice, but being symbolic of obedience to the covenant. Let's go on. Verse 11, circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith, but have not been circumcised. See, the Jews were like, no, Abraham, founder of the Israel, you know, our ancestor, we are, we are Jews because we are descendants of Abraham. And Paul takes them through this argument to say, okay, Abraham was declared righteous because of his faith before circumcision was ever instituted. Therefore, in a certain sense, he is father of all those who are righteous because of their faith in God and not circumcised. And, you know, the Jewish listeners would have heard that and gone, no, no, the, no, that, no. But that was Paul's point their understanding, their trust in the law to provide salvation was misplaced. It needed to be in God. Again, so Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised, but only if they have the same kind of faith that Abraham had before he was circumcised. In other words, circumcision doesn't save. Being right with the Jewish law and practices does not save you. Now, if you were righteous with God before the symbol of circumcision, great, you're in the same boat as all those people that were right with God because they placed their faith in him. Because you are one of those people. You've just followed a procedure, a, a prescribed behavior afterwards. You followed this ritual. But Paul's point is, look, whether Gentile or Jewish, salvation comes one way through one person. It's Christ. Salvation comes through trusting in God, receiving his gift of grace through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, 
to atone for your sin, to remove it from his sight, to declare your record of sin clean, cleared away. That is where salvation comes from, for the Jew and for the Gentile. And Abraham is the spiritual father of both, in that he is the one who was declared righteous by his faith, showing us all the truth of our relationship with God, showing us all the way to be made right with God. It is through faith. Now we can look in other books of the New Testament, like Hebrews, 11th chapter, and see a larger list of those uh, throughout our history that have been great examples of faith and that it was by faith that each one of them was made right with God, not through their actions. And some of them, uh, their faith, very contrary to their actions, uh, led them to be right with God. So, you know, that kind of sets the framework. And this would have turned on ear the common knowledge of the day, the the, the accepted view of the world that these Jewish Christians there in Rome seemed to hold very dear. Uh, they wanted to elevate themselves above the Gentile Christians because of their Jewishness. And Paul's just pointing them back and going, we're all just as, if you will, just as Jewish. Uh, if, if we're saying that our Jewishness is that we are children of Abraham, then those Gentiles over there that acknowledge God and have been declared right with him through faith, they're just as saved, just as Jewish, just as descendant of Abraham as you are. You've just thrown on the layer of ritual and identifiers like circumcision. But you better be sure that you got that made right by faith in God down first, because even Abraham had that down first. Circumcision was an indicator. It was, well, it was what was given to him later to declare this relationship. So we, we need to stay rooted in that reality, that truth. In verse 13, Paul goes on a little further in this discussion. He says, clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. If God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary, and the promise is pointless. See, it wouldn't be a promise of a gift from God, because it would be something we could earn, back to his discussion of the laborers. If you work the job and you receive the paycheck, it's not a gift. There's no grace involved in that. But instead, when there's no way we could earn it, and yet we receive it, it is a gift. That is what God has done for us. So, again, clearly God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to the law, but on a righteous relationship with God that comes by faith. If God's promise is only for those that obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. I don't care how good you consider yourself. I don't care how wonderful you think you are as a person, how law-abiding you think you are as a person. The only way for us to go through this life without ever violating the law, that is God's law, is to not have it. Let's step back. Let's step back to the beginning. Adam and Eve in the garden. You may not have thought about this, or maybe you've given it lots of thought. But in the garden of Eden, there was only one rule, wasn't there? I mean, it was anything goes. 
nothing was considered wrong except one thing. Don't eat from that tree. That was it. Conceivably, humanity at that point could have done anything other than eat from that tree, and it was okay. And when we have a law, what do we do? We break it. The law was never intended to make us right with God. The law was intended to show us our brokenness and our need for a Savior. It was to show us our unrighteousness because the law is the standard of righteousness. God's law given on Mount Sinai was God's standard of righteous. You want to know what it looks like to behave in a way consistent with God's nature and character? Then look at the law. The problem is none of us, none of us measure up to God's nature and character. All of us break the law. Our only hope of not breaking the law is for there to not be a law. It's a simple exercise, and I've, I think I've done it before on podcasts. I know I do it in sermons um, periodically. Simple exercise. Just think of the Ten Commandments. Now, I'm not going to ask you to list them because you get some really weird stuff when you ask people to start listing the Ten Commandments. Uh, you're welcome to look them up over in Exodus. But just think off the top of your head, Ten Commandments. You ever broken one? I mean, ever in your lifetime, have you ever broken one of them? Maybe just once. And you say, well, I, I've never killed anybody. Or I never murdered someone. The commandment's actually to murder, not murder. Um, have you ever harbored anger in your heart towards someone else? Because Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount makes it pretty clear that you have violated that commandment, if that's your case. Have you ever told a lie? I mean, even just one of those little, uh, what do we call them, white lies? Do, are there colors to lies? Uh, one of those little lies, you know, that seems so insignificant. You ever done that ever in your life? Have you ever violated one commandment? Now, if the answer to that is yes, then understand you need a savior because you are guilty of sin. You know, so, but it's just, it, there's being innocent and there's being guilty. And if you're guilty, there's not degrees of guilty. I only killed three people. I didn't kill 35. I think the prison system is probably going to treat you about the same. You know, there's not degrees of guilty. You are either innocent or you're not. In our standing before God, we are either innocent or not. And if there's laws, then we will break them. We will, Paul's actual word is transgress against those laws. We'll, we'll cross them. Our only hope is for there to be no law or for our standing with God not to be dependent on the law. So when he talks about God's promise given to the whole earth through Abraham and his descendants based on not obedience to the law, but on a right relationship, that's powerful and it's important because on that hangs everything. If it was dependent on obedience, then Abraham and everyone else would be up a creek because we we can't do it. So again, in verse 16, as he as he picks up and rolls on, he says, So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses 
or whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham. So what do we have to do to receive this gift, this promise that is received by faith, this free gift that is open to us? What do we have to do? There again in verse 16, and we are all certain to receive it. Whether, whether, what's a whether? Whether we live according to the law of Moses or not, whether we're a Gentile or a Jew, doesn't matter. We're certain to receive it if one condition is met. That condition, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. That's what that passage is talking about. What many nations? We know Abraham's the father of the Jews. He's father of so much more than that. Because any of us who know God and place our faith in him, trusting in him for our salvation, are descendants of Abraham. And we come from every nation. As the gospel has spread through the world. He goes on. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. What a powerful statement. This is because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life. Yeah, the resurrection and who creates new things out of nothing. Theological term there, creatio ex nihilo. It is God spoke and it was. He created out of nothing. Where there was nothingness, God made something. Where there is, even in our own lives, the destruction, the chaos of sin, God moves. And he creates. When we come before God in faith, trusting in him, scripture says that we become a new creation. Yeah. Where there was nothing, there is something. Where we were bound for hell, there is now life and life eternal. What a powerful statement, a powerful verse. It brings the dead back to life and creates new things out of nothing. As Paul finishes out this chapter, picking up in verse 18, He continues with this idea. He says, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham did not weaken, even, or Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age, He figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. I mean, here they are. They're they're elderly almost doesn't cover it. I mean, they're about 100 years of age. It's like the shot at having kids is gone in their minds. And yet God comes in and says, I'm going to make you the father of nations. Your descendants are going to be like, well, see the sand on the seashore? Yeah, your descendants are going to number like the sand on the seashore. See the stars in the heavens? Yeah, it's going to be like that. There's going to be an uncountable number that are your descendants. And you know Abraham's got to be looking over at Sarah going, Really? 
but see, he trusted God. He placed his faith in God. And so it says, even when there was no reason for hope, when he could look at the evidence and go, no, I'm not going to be the father of nations. He kept hoping. He kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations, not just because he was delusional or, well, he wasn't delusional, but it wasn't, he was presented with the facts and just decided, no, I'm going to, I'm going to have my own thing over here. I'm just going to, I like this. This is the happy place. You know, no, he did it for a reason. What was that reason? For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. So even though the evidence was to the contrary, God said it. And that's where he placed his faith in God. If God said that's what's going to happen. I trust him. Do we have that kind of faith? When everything around us may tell us something different, but God has said this. Is that where we place our faith? Or do we start to waffle? Do we waver? Do we start listening to our culture? Do we start listening to what's popular or accepted instead of saying, no, I'm going to stick with what God has said. Because I will guarantee you in your life, everyone will eventually let you down. He was like, Scott, that's not very encouraging. Yeah, but it's reality. People are sinners. Even the best people you know are not God. God is faithful. He calls us to be faithful, but God is the one that will never let you down. He is the one you can trust. Place your faith in him. Place your trust in him. Be like Abraham, trusting in the Lord. Well, going on, it says Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't for it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. That is the truth. That is the promise of God. That is God's faithfulness manifested in Jesus the Christ, dying for our sins, rising again, making us right with God. That's where our hope is. That's where God has shown himself. Well, everywhere God has shown himself to be faithful. But in that, that is what we believe in and we gain right standing with God. We get to be counted as righteous like Abraham was counted as righteous because we have placed our faith in God and in him alone. Not because we've placed our faith in God and done this for him. Not because we placed our faith in God and met all these rules or these guidelines or followed this criteria or learned or memorized these particular things. Now, in our living out of our faith in God, that may involve us engaging or not engaging in certain behaviors. That may be something that we find is strengthened by our investing in growing that relationship with Christ through the memorization of scripture or the use of a daily quiet time, or, you know, numerous things. But understand, none of those things make you right with God. It's only one thing that does faith. 
again, verse 22 and following. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him. So I have to ask you, do you believe in him? It makes all the difference. It resolves the question of eternity because there are only two options. There is being right with God or being eternally separate from God. And God gives you the gift of salvation. If you will place your belief in him, it's not something you earn. It's not something you ever can earn. It is a gift that he is offering to you. Have you turned to him? Have you placed your belief in him? Because he says, God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him. Who is him? The one who raised Jesus, our Lord from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins. He was raised to life to make us right with God. Have you placed your faith in Jesus the Christ? Have you trusted in his atoning sacrifice? paying the price for your sin so you don't have to place your faith in God be made right with him through faith if you've been trying to work your way to be right with God to do enough to be right with God to be involved in church enough or kind enough or anything enough understand it will never be enough God offers you a gift. Will you place your belief in him? Reach out in faith and take hold of that gift. That gift of being right with God. Being made righteous through faith. It is the only way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word. For the truth of your word that is so evident, that reminder that it's not our work. It's your love. It's your faithfulness, your gift of salvation. That we need only place our faith in you. And in doing so, Father, we become part of this long line going back to Abraham. We thank you that you have given us your word that tells us that tells us that Abraham was right with you by faith and shows us throughout history. It's all about faith in you. Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, for the salvation he purchased for our behalf, that we may know you and follow you and be right with you. Lord, help us to find our peace and our strength in that relationship. And that we would be bold in declaring it to others as well. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.